Demons. Hell hell hounds chase ghosts come sleep. sleep. Watch out. Demons are coming. Run. Sleep. Hide. Spirits. Run. Ghosts. Ghosts. Hide. Hell hounds. Demons. Hell hounds. Ghosts. Demons are coming. Welcome home, my little hellhounds. Tonight, we have four scary stories to sink our hellish teeth into. If you have any scary stories you want narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares. Also, if you like this content, then don't forget to subscribe. And if you would be so kind and click that like button as that really helps the channel. And don't forget that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now let's get right into it. The Creepy animatronic posted by dependent ad 87492 so back when i was 21 i used to be a mod for discord now for its update on changing the logo i quit that horrid place so one day i had an idea on going to where that discord ads would be producing so 12 a.m i head in my car put down the gps and went there it was a discord recording studio i thought this wouldn't be exciting as i thought i head inside and to my surprise the place was abandoned what the fuck happened here? I thought to myself. So I explore the place. There was a changing room, a green screen room, an acting room, but the final room caught my eye. A parts and service room. I thought it was used for broken mics or equipment. Wrong. It was a rotting, broken down, animatronic version of Clyde, the Discord logo. But he was different. It was a Neko. One of its ears was missing and exposing wires. It wore a black leather jacket. The body was shaped like a girl and the most scariest thing about the animatronic was it had a rotting dead corpse inside you know what fuck discord fuck this place but before i walked out of the door i heard why do, uh, don't you what what Wanna stay? M M Mike. Then the animatronic got up. It looked at me and said, Run. Now. So, I ran as fast as my legs can carry me. But thank the Lord, I made it out. Then when I left, the animatronic said, You made the right decision. So I'm writing this because the animatronic is outside my house. Construction Nightmare posted by Lost Boy 70 this took place in Southern California in late 2007, early 2008, as my first real job outside of high school. 
in drywall construction. I was 20 and just turned 21. When this happened, I'm now 34 when writing this. I was learning a new skill as a drywaller in a new home construction. Me and my supervisor, the guy teaching me, let's call him Big Al, were working on the weekend on a Saturday morning. We were the only ones on this side of the property. There was maybe 10 people on this whole property. No one else was in the houses. The other people were on the far end of the land, clearing out the trees and land for more homes. So here, where the story begins, me and the supervisor, Big Al, were fixing up a wall in the junior bathroom. He left the house to take a call from the office by my truck. As I started preparing the wall, it was just inside the doorway. It was warm, not hot outside. I was doing my work about five minutes into it. It felt like someone blew on my cheek, which I thought was my boss because he was a big joker. I popped my head out to see if it was him and wasn't. So I moved down the wall and it happened again. So I put down my tools and looked all up the stairs looking for him and looked out of the window and saw him on my tailgate talking on the phone. So I walked to the bathroom to finish up and saw past the doorway in the master bedroom was a freestanding shadow looking at me. It wasn't laying on the floor or the wall. As I went to the bathroom picked up my tools and ran out of the room downstairs almost knocking over my supervisor and threw the tools I had in the bed of the truck and got in the driver's seat. As he came out he said let's get the flying fuck out of here. We got about 20 minutes down the street to a bar and he said I saw the thing in the master bedroom and about 45 minutes later out big boss man calls us up saying that we weren't there and get the fuck back there big al in his southern way of talking hell no and to do something that's impossible for a guy to do to himself about two weeks later I quit because our boss wanted us to go back to that place again. I went back to his office to pick up my last paycheck. Ice on a summer day posted by Coyote. Hello guys, I have experienced something truly bizarre and I don't know how to explain it. Maybe some of you had this happen to you too. Let me know in the comments. So without further ado, let me start the encounter. So it was a really hot summer day and me and my buddy just finished with our school exams and were heading home. Right after passing through a building that people believed it was haunted, we decided to enter and explore it. After entering inside, we didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, besides old furniture that had been brought by people that used to hang out there and have sex, I guess. But 
after stepping on many blankets and bottles, we saw that the house had stairs that lead to the basement and stairs that led to the upper floor. We decided to go for the basement and while the basement was not like a typical horror movie basement with no light and only one staircase, it was still creepy down there. There were windows that dimmed the light inside but there were some corners in that basement that were pretty dark because of the wall angles that didn't let the light go through the whole basement. There also were exits that we could get to get outside the basement. So again, this wasn't the cliche horror movie basement. After going down the stairs, we explored the whole thing and we found nothing out of the ordinary. So we decided to head back and this is where things got weird. Right as we're about to start going up the stairs, I noticed a big object right next to the staircase that started there and finished under the stairs. I told my buddy that I'm about to check it out to see if this is another mattress like the countless mattresses that were there at the time. When I came close though, I saw something as a teenage boy. It shook me to the core. It was a dog and it was dead not just dead but it looked like it was strangled its head was looking behind its body I don't know how to explain this in order for you guys to picture it but imagine the dog's scalp touch his back its neck was broken and his eyes were wide open after seeing this, we wanted to run, but my curiosity got the best of me. For some reason, I was expecting some kind of interaction from it, and I found a stick just so I could poke it. After finding the stick, I poked it a number of times and it felt like I was poking a statue. But clearly this wasn't one as the decomposition of the body was already visible. The weird thing is that there was no smell, no rotten smell or anything to be honest. It was just a common abandoned place smell like old mattresses, alcohol and piss. At this point, we decided to start going upstairs and we talked about why would someone do this while also questioning whether or not this was an intentional strangling or just a car accident that the driver thought it would be a good idea to pick the dog up and throw it in some abandoned place that no one could possibly discover. Anyway, after heading up the stairs, we saw another weird thing. And this, I can't till this day explain. In one of the stairs that were leading to the upper floor, I saw ice, but not an ordinary ice, the kind of ice that forms after an outside tap is open and after being exposed to cold temperatures the water drops form a kind of reverse stalagmite. Keep in mind that there is no water in the ceiling and it's like 40 degrees centigrade or 102 degrees Fahrenheit. 
so then me and my buddy tried to touch it to see if it was actual ice or just a glassy object that really resembled real ice. And it was real. The ice was real. The feeling was so surreal and I couldn't think of anything that could possibly link those two unexplained things together. Later on, I found out that this wasn't a house, but rather an abandoned project for a daycare building, because for some unknown reason, the funding was suddenly cut. What do you guys think? Has anyone encountered any similar occasions like mine? Let me know your thoughts about my story. Be safe everyone and thanks for reading. The case that made me give up being a private investigator posted by Toucan the Rapper. I'm putting this up here because I want to keep it separate from my other case files. You'll see why for now. Just know it didn't feel appropriate keeping it with the endless logs on cheating spouses and track down runaway teens. I'll level. I almost didn't type up this file at all. I nearly burned it. I'd have been more than happy to pretend the following never happened. I changed my mind because I figured that if I stayed silent, somebody else might accidentally go poking down the rabbit hole. So yeah, my story, what you're about to read, took place back in the early 2010s. I didn't know it when I signed that initial contract with Hannah Buxted, but it was the last case I ever took on as a private investigator. Something about the whole gig didn't feel right after. I don't think you'll blame me for moving on to my current career as a debt collector though. It started out routine enough. I got the call on Monday morning while I was groaning away a hangover in the steam from a piping cup of black mud. London is a big place and I'm good at finding people in it. My caseload was never slim. Let's put it that way. The phone ringing first thing on a Monday wasn't unusual. The nature of the case is what excited me enough to put it to the top of my schedule. The caller was Hannah Boxstead, 56, from Hackney. The case, her son Ian, namely. What the London Metropolitan Police weren't telling her about how he died. Hannah didn't agree with their MET's verdict that Ian died by his own hand. When she came to my office that afternoon, she brought screenshots of private conversations, screenshots containing her son's plans, dreams and hopes from the future, the most recent of which was around booking a holiday, written a few hours before his allegedly self-inflicted death. Alone, these would not have led me to suspect I was dealing with anything other than a grieving mother in denial. But then, she showed me the photos she had sneaked of his body when she'd gone to identify it. Sure, 
Ian was covered head to toe in deep cuts. His nose was broken and his naked body in dirt like he'd been sleeping. It was the body of someone who went through a lot of emotions and hardships in their final moments. I agreed with Hannah Boxstead though. This wasn't the body of someone who showed themselves out of the land of the living. Folk who choose their own ending don't die with screams on their faces. Ian was found about three days after his death in a car park behind a warehouse. There were drugs in his system, but not at the levels that should induce dangerous behaviour or overdose. Hannah's research had been thorough and had tailed enough junkie kids to confirm the charts she showed me. Didn't show anything more than a 19 year old put in a little extra kick in his weekend. The cuts and negligible levels of party favours in his system are what led the MET to rule self-murder. To Hannah's delight, I disagreed on both fronts. The wounds couldn't have been self-inflicted. There were too many inch-long cuts in hard-to-reach places for Ian to have made them himself. There were also hundreds of them. He'd have passed out long before getting to the two fatal gashes on his wrists. There were also far too straight, far too precise to be self-inflicted. Ian hadn't been found with a blade, so the ruling was he'd used a broken glass. I've been in enough bar fights to know that shards of glass can't make cuts that perfect. The big question though was this, Ian Boxstead's body was filthy and covered in lacerations. So where was the blood? The MET weren't being honest with Hannah Boxstead and I promised her I would find out why. It's a shame that once I had, I had to start being dishonest with her too. Not because I'm a liar, but because I couldn't risk her digging deeper. My first stop was the possible crime scene. Ian had been found by a homeless guy on an abandoned industrial estate in Bethnal Green turned out to be a waste of an oyster swipe. On the initial journey, at least, the MET had already picked the place clean and a week's worth of the city's background motion had long since washed away any evidence they may have missed. I figured this would probably be the case before I got there, though I needed somewhere to begin and on my usual runaway brat hunts, visiting the last known location was a good way to find that first trail. So yeah, I didn't waste too long in that empty car park the first time I went. The second time, though I woke up there, is a different story. We'll get to that though. At the time I had no reason to be suspicious. I did have a need to send some photos I'd taken from my phone to Hannah Boxstead though. More to show her I was already on the case than anything else. That's why I ducked into the shadowy internet cafe money transfer point across the road from the vacant lot of empty warehouses and abandoned cars. The cramped, poorly lit room was busy. Two beefy blokes behind the counter 
and a dozen or so scrawny guys hunched over keyboards crammed into a room built with no more than eight occupants in mind. They had a nervous look about them. None made eye contact, not only with me, but with each other. They were all working in silence. All I could hear was the whirring of towers, tapping of keys, and the buzz of a fat blue bottle making drunken loops around the ceiling fan. It wasn't till I sat down and booted up the aging Windows 98 that I noticed the lack of speakers. None of the £8 an hour PCs had them. There weren't even any blaring, tiny, badly tuned local radio from behind the counter either. A distinct oddity in London. The towers were also missing headphone or aux jacks. The audible cable slots of both mine and my neighbour's computers had been crudely melted, closed, with a lighter or small blowtorch. I wish I'd been curious enough to investigate this further. I'd have saved myself a lot of hassle later on. As it was, I just shrugged and emailed the new crime scene photos across to Hannah Boxstead. Shrugging off the massive red flag as one of life's little weird moments. My second line of inquiry was the list of Ian's friends provided by Hannah Boxstead. One of them, a lad based in Elephant and Castle, agreed to meet me. An aspiring solicitor named Ashim Anand. A now former classmate of the deceased. I was surprised to find Ashim Anand was as eager to meet with me as I was him. He'd been with Ian on the night of the latter's suspicious passing. He had video evidence to prove it too. After some brief introductions at his ENC flat, mine clipped and impatient, his shaky and hushed, he showed me a series of clips on his phone. I'll spare you the red herring, the illegal rave Ashim, Ian and a handful of other future lawmakers had visited that night wasn't in the warehouse that I would soon wake up outside covered in my own sweat and gibbering like a madman. It was a similar disused unit about a mile away one that was regularly used for such underground events. Judging by the intricacy of the sound system and lightning rigs visible on the small screen. The first few videos were normal. Ian and his friends laughing, dancing and smelling the white powder on somebody's coffee table. It was the fourth video that made the colour drain from both mine and Asim's face. It was about 30 seconds into this clip, almost out of shot by the speaker, a few feet behind the gurning Asim and two girls that Ian changed. Not started changing, changed. It was instantaneous. One frame, he was Ian Boxstead, and the next, he was not. In the space of a single strobe flash, Ian went from grinning and dancing to standing stock still. He was so tense and upright that he'd be forgiven for thinking some unseen spirit had rammed an iron rod up and through his spine to the base of his skull. Plenty of the other 
revelers had twisted, contorted faces. Powders and pills have that effect. That's why I think none of them reacted to Ian's face with the same gulp and sharp intake of breath as I did. One moment, Ian's features had been locked in a happy toothy grin. The next frame, they were still in a toothy grin all right, but it was far from happy. It was far from anything. After the switch, the corners of Ian's mouth curled up so much they almost spiralled in on themselves. The lips between them were stretched and tautly that splits and tricklets of blood appeared within a few seconds. New eyes bulged far further than any chemical could induce. Rings of purple flesh surrounded them as they twitched and heaved in the sockets trying to free themselves from his face. His eyelids folded back and in on themselves, exposing the pulsing veins and capillaries on their undersides. Over the next five or six videos, Asim showed me Ian standing in the same spot with that twisted grin from various different angles. No matter where Asim had filmed from, the bolt upright Ian was visible in the background, unmoving for what must have been a couple of hours. Asim had studied the footage well because it took him pointing out the strange way Ian was breathing for me to notice. Impressive, considering I made a comfortable living out of noticing things. Ian Boxstead was alternating which lung he breathed out of, left, then right, left, then right, nostrils flaring alternately, in short arithmetic bursts. He stood there, leaning to and fro slightly as the opposing halves of his chest rose and fell like a seesaw right until the final two videos. I am a proud man. I value my stoicism. It brings me no joy at all to admit that I let out a high pitch yelp when in the penultimate clip the grinning statue did the unthinkable. It moved on a trigger known only to whatever mind lay behind those bulging eyes the Ian thing turned 180 on its left heel it marched through a crowd of gurning ravers moving its legs with stiff but fluid swings like a parading soldier or 50s lead wind-up toy. Before the footage ended, it was standing in front of a man-sized speaker, face inches away from the vibrating surface. The last footage was of Asim vomiting purple liquid into a bin. Over his shoulder, Ian Boxstead was clearly visible. He was pushing his head into the speaker with such force that his skull rattled violently. He held it there for a full five minutes until dark streaks started to pour from his ears and pull at his chin. Before the clip cut to black, I was given a brief glance of his mangled, broken face. The curled grin was gone. The nose was broken and the blood from the fresh wounds was mixed with confused tears. Ian had vanished after that. Asim Anand agreed to send me the footage 
on the condition that I never contacted him again. He was very clear that he'd only reached out to me to pass the torch, so to speak. He wanted out. I should have followed his example. Ain't hindsight a bitch. I uploaded the clips to YouTube when I got back to my office and took a nap. This is actually a pro gamer move. In the world of private investigation, if someone is hiding, then they can't resist testing how findable they are. Besides, I had no idea what the hell I was looking at anyway. I was hoping just as much for an explanation of the kind of psychological break that caused Ian's behaviour as I was for another lead. My theory was something neurological at this point. You understand, something still grounded in the rational, the explainable. When I woke, a few hours later, I still had no explanation, but I did have another lead among the hundreds of cries of fake which protected my montage video from a takedown there was one that offered a glimmer of hope well what I thought at the time was hope what was it the red squid guy said in Star Wars anyway one commenter left a lengthy response urging me to reach out the poster claimed to have witnessed the exact same thing at another nightclub a few months prior and had a video to prove it. My mind began racing with the visions of me on the front page of the papers, the hero that exposed the dangerous new high killing London's youth. I couldn't reply to Speaker Rider 81 fast enough. I fist pumped when he responded in five minutes to tell me he lived so close I could be on his doorstep in about ten. The journey was short but not simple. The Blackberry route planner took me down alleys and side passages I hadn't known of before despite living in the area for over a decade. The ruckus of the main roads dimmed into quietness with each turn, the amber haze of light pollution that associated with civilization less and less visible on each new unfamiliar street. My phone assured me the journey had indeed only taken 10 minutes by the time I reached the right row of terraced houses in the maze of terraced houses. It felt a lot longer though and my legs ached to prove it other than a hallway light on the second floor of the first house I passed a bed raggled fox digging through a wheelie bin was the only sign of life I shivered despite the night air not being cold. Speaker Rider 81 lived at house number 12 on this suburban street. When I knocked on the red wooden door despite no lights being on in his house either. I found it unlocked and swinging open on a single light tap from my knuckles. I walked in half expecting to find signs of burglary or a struggle. Maybe even a squat full of junkies and vagrants. What I didn't expect to find was the cleanest and emptiest house I'd ever come across. The house was uninhibited, not just by people but by anything I spent nearly two hours pulling up floorboards and scouring empty cupboards determined not to have wasted time on what now 
felt like an obvious prank. Well, what at first felt like an obvious prank. The more time I spent pulling apart the house though, the more my frantic searching regained solid purpose. Something was wrong with that house, and until I found out whatever I was looking for, I couldn't put my finger on exactly what. My first guess was show home, but even there decked with some kind of furniture beyond built-in cupboards. The house's exterior had been filthy and dilapidated, like the rest of the street. The inside couldn't have been further from this, with the exception of the exposed concrete or floorboards. Even the kitchen and bathroom had no tiles or linoleum. Every surface had been cleaned to sterility recently too. Some of the walls were still damp and the faint acrid tang of bleach was still in the air. What furniture did remain, the aforementioned cupboards and walled-in sinks and bathroom facilities had received the same treatment. They'd been scrubbed too immaculately. I doubt I could have even found a flake of dead skin. Never mind Speaker Rider 81 or his case cracking footage. In the end I gave up and pulled out my phone to call a taxi. The poor woman on the other end of the line had never heard of the address and neither had her computer system. This was one normality ignoring lump of weirdness. Too many for me. I did what I always do when I feel out of my depth. I saw red. My profanity laden attempts to explain my location were loud. That's why I didn't hear the guy with the cricket bat unlock the front door. When I came to, I was strapped to a chair. The top of my skull ached and when I moved I could feel the peeling of dried blood on the back of my neck. I wasn't alone. Three of the men from the Currency Exchange Internet Cafe were standing over me. They weren't around for long though. I had just enough time to start yelling at them, reminding them that I recognised them and knew who they fucking were when the wordlessly turned and left single file through a heavy metal door. The room, it clanged shut behind, was as unsettlingly clean as Speaker Rider's 81's house. I knew I must have been moved at least a few miles because the vents and pipes on the whitewashed brick walls screamed industrial warehouse. The smell of bleach was stronger here, strong enough to cough and gag as I struggled against the thick belts holding me in place. There were other smells too, disinfectant, chlorine and other detergent vapours that sting the nostrils and burn the lungs. For a moment I worried they were gassing me, but when the actual reason for their bringing me here revealed itself, I realised I wasn't so lucky. The only object in the room aside from myself and the chair was a small Bluetooth speaker standing alone on the polished concrete a few feet in front of me. It was one of those portable jobs that couldn't have been larger than my fist. Only a few seconds after I paid it attention, the green LED indicating a paired connection shimmered into life. The music it played to the echoey room was tinny, a warbling mix 
that was all treble and no bass. The tune itself wasn't remarkable. It was some pop hit that had been popular that summer. Katy Perry or Taylor Swift, I think. How much the screeching tones made my face itch immediately caught my attention. I began yanking and pulling against the thick belts, no longer trying to free myself, but just a hand to scratch my face. Within a few seconds, the unpleasant scritch scratch across my every facial feature had me twisting them in agony. It was at this point that I stopped seeing red and started seeing yellow before I could scream, though there was a click. The glare of the strip bulb cutting out and throwing the bleach-coated room into darkness took me completely by surprise. Surprise that I didn't have long to wallow in. The muscles in my back tensed. The moment the light left, I felt something other than my shadow step in to take its place. Something behind me. Some presence. I was aware of as the leather belts stopping me from running for the door. I couldn't hear it, but I knew from the growing prickling replacing the sensation of dry blood on my neck that it was taking slow, deliberate steps towards me. I did scream now, a loud scream. A scream even the hypervigilant machismo I inherited from my father isn't ashamed of. It was when those screams bounced and echoed off the hidden walls that I noticed they and the waves of tinny noise from the speaker weren't behaving right. They weren't reverberating evenly around the room as they should have been. They were being directed, every yell, every bar of tinny pop music rushing back past my ears, much louder on the return journey, every sound zipped and whirred, like a passing freight train pulled behind me, either by or into whatever was now gut churningly close to the back of my neck. The itching in my face had progressed to burning by this point, as had the hot breath on the back of my neck. I wrenched against the belts so hard that rivers of warm redness descended from the new flashes of pain at my wrists and ankles. My yells, pleas and screams were all sucked behind me wishing past my ears and vanishing without echo or reverb. The scalding breath moved up to behind my left ear. The corners of my mouth felt more and more like they were soaked in acid with every inch it moved. I must have still been screaming, but I could no longer hear it. The barrage of sound ripped through every bone and ligament of my body, crushing and squeezing them with an intense pressure I cannot explain. Nor do I ever want to be able to. The excruciating vibrations reached their final crescendo when the thing they gave form placed a clawed, bleach-smelling hand on my shoulder. Everything stopped in an instant. The burning, the crushing pressure on my insides and the boiling grip of that gnarled, translucent hand were gone. That would have relieved me were it not for everything else going along with them. My limbs, a moment ago screaming in agony as they fought a losing battle against leather bindings, had gone. My throbbing eyes no longer throbbed. 
because they no longer anything. My screaming had ceased because I had no mouth to scream with. I was nothing beyond disembodied awareness, a bodiless sense of dread and witting sanity, drifting alone in a void. At least I was alone at first. Once I was aware of my lack of surroundings, things started to notice me, things that moved and shifted in the dark, curious things intrigued by movement in this place where all had been still since before there was a universe for our star to be birthed in I could feel or sense or know them circling around me their hunger was palpable it filled the empty space and if I had lungs the fear I became would have burst them I felt the first of these unspeakable presences crash upon me when for the second time everything stopped. I could feel tarmac against my cheek. That didn't amaze me as much as the fact I could feel my cheek and my face and my arms and legs and all the other parts I was supposed to have. They hurt but they weren't burning two good reasons to open my eyes. I was in a car park by a warehouse, the same car park the unfortunate homeless man had found the even more unfortunate Ian Boxstead's body in. I was naked, bruised and covered in a few cuts, but alive. As my memories of how I'd found myself naked hurt and on the concrete started to return so did a panic rise in my gut I ran screaming from that car park in the end looking up to see the three men from the sterilised room one of them menacingly holding a cricket bat looking down from a window on the top floor was enough their messages in their hate filled expressions were clear that was a warning don't go poking around where you're not wanted at first I thought they were worried I'd expose them now I know better I never accepted another case I shut down my LTD company and all websites and social accounts but not before crying under a cold shower for 8 hours straight I've never gone back to Bethnal Green. I don't know if that, those, whatever happened, is limited to there. I've avoided spending too long around speakers in the years since though, just in case. I told Hannah Boxstead the trail had run cold. What else could I do? she broke down into uncontrollable sobs. This was when I first noticed something had changed in me. Her tears meant nothing to me. They prompted no pity, yet at the same time no annoyance emotionally. I was completely blank. It's been the same ever since. My psychiatrist uses words like sociopath, or personality disorder. I know better though. When that thing touched my core in the void, it took something with it. It left me half full, partially empty, missing whatever parts of the spirit or soul that allows you to connect with others. It's probably why I do so well as a debt collector. The sight of crying mothers and sobbing children does nothing to me as I break a father's arms over insignificantly small missed gambling payments. That's why I don't want you to go digging. I don't want to risk anyone following me down the rabbit hole as scared of it 
as I was, the thing in Bethnal Green has blessed me. It chose me. I was worthy. Where Ian and the men from the Internet Cafe were not. It's a burden. Being there chosen. It's one I wish I'd never taken. But now it's mine. I will never release it. Those things in the dark are mine. Their blessing is mine. When I'm ready, I will go back to Bethnal Green. I will turn on my speakers and meet them again. Once more, I will bask in their liberating touch. And I refuse to share it with anyone. And that's it for tonight, my little hellhounds. Thank you for listening. If you like this content, don't forget to subscribe and like the video and click that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now, good night, my little hellhounds. Thank <laughs> you.